All right, let's, uh, let's start the afternoon session. My name is Aaron Falk. I work for Akamai, and I'm going to be uh, chairing the afternoon session. Um, our first talk is implementing IPv6 segment routing on the Linux kernel. Uh, Olivier Bonaventure is uh, presenting on behalf of David Lebrun, the co-author. Uh, Olivier is a professor at UCL in Louvain-en-Neuve, Belgium, where he leads the IP networking lab. His students have contributed to various implementations of IP, IETF protocols, including SHIM-6, LISP, Multipath TCP, and now IPv6 segment routing. He's also editor of SIGCOM's uh, Computer Communications Review, where he encourages authors to release the software and data sets that enable uh, reproduction of the results described in the accepted papers. Uh, Olivier? Thank you. A loose source route inside an IPv6 extension header that contains a list of segments and there are basically three types of segments. You can specify a node so you can force the packet to pass through a specific router and in this case you will use the router loop back address <laughs> as a segment endpoint so you can force the packet to pass through a specific router. You can specify an adjacency segment so you can force a packet to be forwarded on one egress link on one router which forces you to use a specific outgoing interface and it's also possible to uh, use an IPv6 address to encode a virtual function that will be applied on the packet on a router to support NFV, for example. And there are lots of use cases for IPv6 segment routing, and uh, there are working group discussions within the ITF on that. So how do we do that? We define an IPv6 segment routing header, so a new IPv6 <laughs> extension. And what do we find in this IPv6 extension? Well, a list of IP addresses that are the intermediate segments. So we can have a list of segments inside the IPv6 extension header. And each segment uses one IPv6 address. And then, as with the traditional source routing implementation, you have the number of remaining segments and the index of the last segment in the packet. And there is extensibility with TLV objects that you can add inside the IPv6 segment routing header. So nothing really special. What's important is that you have a list of segments inside each packet. What kind of use case can you do with IPv6 segment routing? You can give full control on your network to the end host. And in this case, the end host will add the segment routing header to all the packets that it sent so that the packets will be forwarded along the path which is chosen by the application or chosen by the network administrator you, uh, which is <laughs> with configuring the network. So you can do end-to-end -end, uh, pass control inside a network. You can force packet to pass through a specific function, which is a software function that you have placed on one of the router. 
So here, there is a special function which is running on router 5, and this function running on router 5, you want it to be applied for all the packets that are sent by a given client. Maybe this function is a firewall, and you would like this device to send all its packets through a firewall. Just add the function in the IPv6 segment router, header, routing header, the packet will go to the router, and then the function is applied, and then the packet continues until it reaches the destination. You can also do segment routing, IPv6 segment routing, at the routers only, and not at the endpoint. So the endpoint is using plain IPv6. Uh, sorry, it doesn't work with IPv4, but nobody's interested in IPv4 in this room, I guess. <laughs> so you can encapsulate the packet and add a segment routing header to the packet so that the packet follows a specific path in the network. And then you decapsulate at the egress, which means that you are doing IPv6 segment routing only between the routers and you don't have to mess up with the endpoints. Security, so I mentioned we had issues with IPv4, we had issues with IPv6, how do we get rid of those security issues with, IP, with segment routing? Basically, you can add inside the segment routing header, an uh, HMAC TLV, which allows you to verify that the segment routing extension has been inserted by a trusted device. And typically the trusted device, they would have a special key. And knowing the key, you can compute the HMAC that authenticates the packet. So what's the typical use case? You will configure all the routers in your network with the HMAC key. And then <coughs> some device will be allowed to do some specific segments through the network. You give them either the full segments that they have to use to do cut and paste in the packets that they send. So if you want, for example, all the client device to pass through a specific firewall, then you give them a segment routing header that forces them to always pass through the, the firewall. And you can verify the HMAC only at the ingress of the router. And you can also configure that by using SDN or other techniques. Second point, implementation in the Linux kernel. So if you look at what's happening in a typical Linux kernel when you process packets, you go from one network interface to another, and the, the functions that you will apply to the packet are the pre-routing step. Then you have the routing decision that decides whether the, the packet is local or whether it needs to be forwarded. If it's local, it goes through the input processing, and then it goes to the local processes. And then you have the output processing, routing decision, forward and post-routing. And typically, you have three paths inside the Linux kernel to process packets. The first one is the, is the horizontal path where you will forward IPv6 packets, where you have pre-routing, routing decision, then forwarding and post-routing. If the packet is destined to the node, then you will do pre-routing. You check that the packet is local, and then you do the input processing. And if you send the packet from the node to the, to the outside, then you have the output processing, the routing decision, and the post-routing to send the packet. So what do we change uh, with IPv6 segment routing? Well, you have to change the way the packets that contain a segment routing header will be processed. And let's take uh, two examples. The first one is the router is one of the segments in the list. So you have received an IPv6 packet that contains a segment routing header. And this segment routing header contains the loopback address of the router as one of the addresses of the segment routing header. So the packet was destined to this node, at least from a segment routing viewpoint. So the packet will arrive. The destination of the packet is virtually the router. So it goes to the input processing. In the input processing, we look at the segment routing header. We find that we have reached one step in the segment routing header. And then we will update the segment routing header before forwarding the packet back to the final destination which means that the packet is updated and then it will be re-injected inside the stack so that it can be routed and forwarded to the outgoing interface with a modified header so that it can go to the next stop inside the network. If the packet was an encapsulated packet and we are the egress of the tunnel, then what happens is that the destination of the packet was the router itself. So we will run the decapsulation of the packet in the input processing and once we have run the decapsulation, we have back an IPv6 packet that needs to be again forwarded and we do the routing and we forward the packet to the final destination. So how can we conf configure IPv6 segment routing with the Linux implementation? Basically the control plane in, on Linux, you have IP root 2, which allows you to manipulate the routing tables and manipulate the configuration of the interfaces. 
And IP route 2 receives comments from uh, RTNet link. And basically, in the IPv6 segment routing implementation, we extend RTNet link to support what is required to uh, manipulate and to configure IPv6 segment routing. And here you have an example of the IP command, which applies, of course, to IPv6, where you specify that all the packets whose destination is FC42 slash 64, so you match the destination address. When you match this destination address, you will encapsulate the packet with IPv6 segment routing. That's the second part of the command. And you will add the segments, which is simply specified as a list of IPv6 addresses with, a commas, with, a, with commas to indicate the segment that, that needs to be attached in the encapsulated packet. So this would typically run on an ingress router where you would have to add a segment to a packet that matches a given destination. And there are other ways to configure it, to configure it as well. Segment routing can also be used directly by applications. And in this case, we modify the socket API so that in the socket API, when you create the socket, for example, this is for a TCP connection. When you create the socket, you specify the segment routing address that has to be used for all the TCP packets that are sent over this specific connection. So if the application knows what is the segment routing header that it has to use, then it simply creates a segment routing header, adds it as a socket option to the socket, and then automatically the state is placed in the Linux kernel, and all the packets from this TCP connection will follow the path specified by the segment routing header. So this is not very complex. For the HMAC, I told you that HMAC allows to verify the integrity and the authenticity of a segment routing header. And there are three knobs that can be controlled on a router to decide how the router will process the packets with an HMAC. The first method is to ignore HMAC all the time. You can also verify the packets that contain an HMAC and forward the packets without an HMAC. Or you can be strict. And if the packet contains an HMAC, you verify it, and you process it if the HMAC is valid. And if the packet does not contain an HMAC, then you discard the packet. So the, the packets there would be discarded. There is a mistake in the slide. So everything has been implemented by David in the Linux kernel. So it was initially in Linux 4.10. And it, uh, so it's part of the mainline kernel. And it has been improved. And now it is the, the improved version is part of Linux 4.12. So the next time you download a recent Linux kernel, you will have IPv6 segment routing for free, and you will be able to play with it. And I've seen that at the hackathon, there is a, a group doing a configuration with netconf on top of the IPv6 segment routing implementation already. So people are already playing with, playing with it. So let's look at the performance of the implementation. So to test the implementation, we use the lab. So we, we took three Intel Xeon uh, servers each with four cores, eight threads at 2.5 to 2.50 gigahertz, uh, 10 gig Ethernet cards. We configured the Ethernet cards to have one Q per CPU and one IQ per Q. Uh, we disabled TSO and GRO to have the worst case. So TSO is TCP segmentation of load and GRO is generic receive of load. And this is the solution in Linux to be able to batch packets together. And it's typically used to support uh, TCP connections, when you have multiple packets that use the same TCP options and the same uh, IPv6 uh, headers, then they can be glued together so that you have only one uh, interrupt for the Linux kernel. But this does not apply to routers, so we disable those uh, improvements. And we use PackageGen, which is the in-kernel module to send UDP packets that we modify to send IPv6 segment routing headers. So we first try to see in this setup what is the baseline IPv6 performance. And we have a, a bit more than 1.1 million packets per second for 64 bytes packets. And we use this as a baseline, baseline to compare the performance of the IPv6 segment routing extension. So the first test we did with inline injection. So we add the segment routing header or we do encapsulation. There is no difference, no significant difference from a performance viewpoint between the two operations. But we saw that there is a huge gap between the plain IPv6 forwarding performance and the throughput that we obtain with IPv6 segment routing. So David had a more detailed look at the implementation and he did some tuning. And he found that there were two reasons for this lower performance in, with IPv6 segment routing compared to regular IPv6 forwarding. The first one is that 
the IPv6 segment routing implementation did not use completely the cache that were available in the IPv6 implementation, so this was fixed. And there was a strange issue with the memory allocation where in some cases, when you freed some memory for a socket buff for, a, for an SKB that represents a packet, sometimes it took the slow pass and it considered that since we have multiple, proce multiple CPUs, you had to take a spin lock to be able to do the free and so on, and this slowed down the performance a lot. So David fixed that and he improved the performance so that we reach now uh, 1 million packets per second for inline injection and almost the same for encapsulation. So we have the same results and we are pretty close to what we do with IPv6 uh, regular forwarding. The main difference is that we basically have to do two lookups possibly because we go again in the kernel. So it's normal that we have lower performance, but the difference is not so huge anymore. So this is reasonable performance for a single core. So we have one CPU doing that on a 10 gig interface. We looked at whether there was a difference between long and short packets. So in red, you see the 1000 bytes packets. And in blue, you have the 64 bytes packet that were the default. There is no significant difference. And the cost is the header processing. It's not the data movement. So which is good. Uh, we looked at the HMAC. So if you have to compute an HMAC with SHA-256 for each IPv6 header that you have to process, there is a cost and there is no surprise. So you get a bit more than 200,000 uh, packets per second with a generic implementation of HMAC uh, SHA-256 in the Linux kernel. If you use the version which uh, uses special uh, Intel assembly instruction, then you have slightly better. You are close to 300,000 packets per second which is not too bad, but this is still very significant. And doing an HMAC computation is much more co costly than doing a lookup in the IPv6 routing table. The good news is that if you use multiple cores, then when you have multiple cores, it's possible to attach one IRQ <laughs> and one Q for the NIC to each CPU, and then to do load balancing of the different uh, packets that you receive automatically from the NIC to the CPUs. And basically, you can parallelize the, pro the forwarding of the IPv6 packets. So this is with eight CPUs. But basically, we have four physical CPUs, and each CPU is using two threads. So with four, with four physical CPUs, we reach about 5 million packets per second uh, with plain IPv6. And with SRV6, we are at 4.2 million packets per second which is reasonable and HMAC is improved, but we only reach 1 million packets per second. So to summarize and to conclude, I can say that thanks to the work of David uh, during the, his entire PhD thesis, IPv6 segment routing has matured. So now we have a stable specification. You will see discussions within the ITF. There are many use cases with IPv6 segment routing beyond those that are discussed in this presentation. I think what's good, if I look at uh, the evolution of ITF protocols and the importance of having an open source implementation, is that this implementation is already part of the mainline Linux kernel, so you can use it easily, and it supports both the NOS functions for clients and servers, and it has the basic router functions within the ITF. There are still discussions on adding a more specific uh, router functions, such as doing uh, encapsulation of V4 inside V6 and other types of uh, forwarding functions that are not yet implemented, but I guess they will be implemented in the coming months. And the performance evaluation shows that the performance of IPv6 segment routing is reasonably good, and unsurprisingly, the using HMAX has an impact on the performance. Thank you. Any questions for Lydia? Hi. Um, so this is really cool stuff. Um, so I, I want to ask a question about the, the bottom one there. Un, unsurprisingly, HMAC TLB affects performance. Yes, because there's a lot more work that has to happen. Is that with with the the algorithms that are used there? Is that or the the ciphers that are used there? Is that a thing that could be hardware um, accelerated in a Linux based router, or does the design of this preclude that? I don't think that the design precludes a hardware acceleration. Okay, cool. So it, it just seems like this is a, we have chips that can accelerate pr 
probably but, uh, but uh, I'm not a hardware guy, right. so I cannot okay. tell you which ship, which ship you have to use. Okay, cool. Um, I have a, a couple questions. So you said you, uh, this is going to be showing up in the IETF. Uh, where is it going to be introduced? So there are two places where there are discussions about segment routing. So there is a spring working group, which is the, the so spring source packet routing in networks. So this is dedicated to segment routing, and the IPv6 version is discussed in six months, where there will be a fight on the segment routing header and <laughs> whether you can use IPv6 headers or not. But that's another discussion. Love a good ITF fight. Um, also, uh, uh, I can't remember from uh, from sort of traditional uh, source routing, but what's the correct behavior um, if um, one of the uh, waypoint addresses is unreachable? Should the packet be discarded, or do you skip um, waypoints that you can't get to? Or is it, can you specify the behavior? Yeah, so the question, what happens when you have a waypoint that you cannot reach? It really depends on the use case that you use. So whether you have end-to-end -end solution or whether you have encapsulation or not. So if you have an end-to-end -end solution, uh, wait, like this one, mm -hmm. if you, are, you have specified that one of the address was had to be used to reach the destination, then if this one, if say a uh, router six is not available, mm -hmm. then you should receive an ICMP back to the source, and the source will know that there is a problem of reachability of, R, of R6. But you are not forced to use R6 as a, well, the segment that you use does not necessarily be an IPv6 address of one node. So you can have an IPv6 address that corresponds to multiple nodes, so you could say, uh, I send a packet to one IP address within a prefix, and then you can use any of the nodes inside this prefix to be forwarded. And you can assign the same loopback address to multiple routers as well. So you are not always in a situation where you are forced to go to a device that does not exist anymore. While, but if you are in the NCAP solution, in the NCAP solu when you have encapsulation, then the situation is different. Because there you have to return the ICMP back to the encapsulation point so that the, the source is hidden from this uh, IPv6 segment routing stuff. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A quick clarification. Is there any impact due to number of segments that were added in the header from so the implementation? MTU system? impact? Yeah. Not MTU impact, just uh, computing. Uh, computational wise from the host if you have four segments versus six segments so on in a software implementation like the Linux one the number of uh, segments that you use does not have an impact but if you go in a hardware implementation I know that for MPLS version of segment routing there are some chips that are limited to three or four to a depth of three or four and it's likely that they will, it will be the same for IPv6 as well but I don't know the specs of the hardware platforms that are used to support IPv6 in hardware. Uh, do you know, okay, so you don't know how many number segments were used in this test? No, I, on the Linux implementation, we have no issue with the number of segments. But I know that there are, there are chipsets where you are limited to three or four, but I cannot give you specific, specific numbers. Do you know something? Yeah. <laughs> I was just curious. <laughs> Um, okay, any other questions? <coughs> Great. Thank you, Olivia. Um, okay, Thomas. So, in the meantime, water has materialized in the bed. Olivier, did you take the uh, little remote? Oh, here it is. Sorry. Sorry, it's right here in front of me. Sorry. Okay, while he's setting up, um, oh, sorry, we're taking a water break. We were waiting for everybody to look away so we could slip in the next talk. People might.
Yeah. Yes. Better make sure it's on. Uh, bye. Get some water for yourself? Okay, everybody hydrated, caffeinated? Good, all right. So, uh, yes, no thank you, I'm, I'm good, I've got coffee. Uh, so our next talk is managing resource constrained IoT devices through dynamically generated and deployed Yang models, uh, presented by Thomas Schleffer. Thomas has worked for 20 years in the field of IP-based data communications. Since 2008, he's taught data communications, network engineering, and network security at Booth Hochschule a University of Applied Sciences in Berlin, Germany. He's participated in a number of European research projects in the area of IPv6 transition and deployment and network security issues. His current research interests are IoT deployment and IPv6 security threat mitigation techniques. Co-author Thomas Schleffer holds a diploma in computer science from Technical University of Dresden and a doctorate from Potsdam University, both in Germany. Thomas. <laughs> That's right. Oh, thank you, Aaron, for introducing. So um, now onto something completely different, I feel. <laughs> uh, it's much more um, application-oriented what I'm presenting here today, but uh, maybe has some applications for general uh, internet area as well. Um, so this work is grown out of um, yeah, some, some work I've doing with my students for quite a couple of times. So we, we what we do with them is we program these little devices here, which are sort of 8-bit microcontrollers and trying to do IPv6 on them. So, um, <laughs> um, and since everybody now so, sort of catches up to this and, and has this funny, funny IoT um, name for, for this, which um, I, I feel like um, it's, yeah, there's just there, the I is, seems to be or supposed to be stand for internet, but I, I always have the, the um, feeling that it's much more the people who develop these kind of applications are much more treating the internet as a bit pipe and and don't really make use of of uh, what what infrastructure we already have there. So I think uh, my idea is to maybe put some more internet into the internet of things than uh, there is at the moment. Um, so I'm trying to um, use some stuff which has been mentioned um, already, NetConf, MQTT, something which is not entirely internet-based, but uh, something which is maybe useful for, for these kind of devices. Um, and what we're trying to do is, or what we did is, what we um, made is, uh, we made some Yang models um, and constructed them uh, dynamically from uh, data which we have on these devices. And what I want to do here today is sort of present, present this and, and maybe discuss this with you if this is uh, a good approach or if something else may work or whatever um, and, and have some feedback on, on um, what we should do. So well, I'll try to start with some, some really funny pictures here. Um, so, so basically um, there, there's, there's been some, some uh, probably something you've seen yourself. I mean, if you look at a, a normal IoT installation today, it probably looks something like this. You have a, a jumbo of middle boxes and uh, uh, things which aren't really connected to each other. I mean, they may be connected to the internet, but it's, that's the only um, common um, feature we see here. Uh, so you, you got a lot of different um, ecosystems. Each one sort of tries to keep their devices much, 
close together and and then to themselves so so they uh, the, the fight at the moment is really about who's owning these devices and uh, who who's getting the data and, and how to how to protect your your investment but it's it's not so much about making this stuff interoperable um, so in, on the other side, it looks like this, that sort of each of them comes with their own little um, app uh, in order to manage it. So uh, it requires a lot of user attention and re requires a lot of um, effort to actually manage such a um, IoT installation. And it may work in a, in a home environment, but if you're thinking about industrial um, deployments, then it's definitely something which is maybe not the right way to do. Um, that sort of you have a closed ecosystem with an, with an IoT app on the one side on your mobile phone and uh, a, a closed device on the other side. So uh, we, we really need to open up this a little bit more. That's my idea that, uh, that would, much, would make much more sense if you had uh, a much more open um, installation. So um, our idea for this work was that what needs to be done to make or to break the, this current status quo where everybody is is, is building um, closed ecosystems and everybody invents or lives in their own little bubble and in and, and, and a lot of st supposedly standards being developed but each of these standards is just basically some way to to lock you in into some certain um, vendor um, or un in some certain sort of set of vendor control so we actually ask, is, is, is it possible to use some real standards-based uh, uh, approach where you say, oh, there, there are standards to, to manage devices, there are standards to manage networks. Maybe we could use these same kind of standards also in, in, in this do IoT domain and not try to invent something new again. So the task which we had to identify or which we had to, to um, address was actually first of all try to find a suitable network management approach for um, these kind of uh, scenarios and um, if we then agree on what what we wanted to do with this devices we um, we are actually done in, in in the situations that sort of you you have these very um, very um, simple tiny devices which, which um, may not be user accessible or they may be built into some some other appliances and um, what you really want to do is if we talk about an IOT scenario where we have, where we have uh, hundreds and thousands of these devices that um, you don't want to manage this manually you don't want to um, go to every single device and do some onboarding, do some bootstrapping procedure. You you want to have these devices to announce their capabilities and their presence in the network, and um, then make this sort of discover make this network discoverable. So um, what you need to actually do is now to to sort of bridge a gap between the um, the uh, level of understanding the device of has of of its capabilities to uh, what the network management function can actually then uh, discover and control. So. <laughs> So the obvious XKCD comic on this <laughs> is actually sort of, yeah, everybody sort of talks about we, we're building new standards and <laughs> um, it, it doesn't work by sort of now going to this scene and say, oh, we, we build a new standard uh, because uh, what will happen is that we only have one more um, and, and, and in the end we get much more confused. And by the way, if, like 15 competing standards in the IoT uh, domain is, is a ric ridiculous low lumber. I mean, you, you've got much more than this. So um, that, that's the current situation or at least how I perceive it. So let's talk a little bit about NetConf and how we could use it. Um, so NetConf, you probably all know, is kind of the the big thing in the ITF. So everybody defines Yang models, everybody uses NetConf. But if you look outside the ITF, my feeling is that nobody knows it. So nobody really has a, a, an idea that, that there there is something other than SNMP and, and we could use it for, for uh, lots of things. Um, it has all these nice features built in, so the sort of distinguishing between state and operation, uh, manage whole networks, not individual devices, and 
have, have discoverability, uh, discoverability built in, have a data model language which could be used to define services, etc. So um, NetConf is actually, I feel like um, a good starting point for, for also doing other stuff than sort of managing routers and switches. So um, we, we have this protocol, we have the Yang models which we could um, use for, for um, describing uh, data on, or describing capabilities of other, other things than, than just routers and switches. So what we wanted to do is use, use these kind of um, protocols in, in comparison or together with, with our very low powered, very constrained devices. And what we found out is that there's actually not a good uh, working model for um, using that on these devices. So um, first of all, our device will not be able to process as XML. Uh, I mean, it's kind of obvious we have like eight kilobyte of RAM. So whenever an IP packet comes in, maybe a quarter of our uh, memory is already uh, assigned. So kind of difficult to do XML parsing in such a scenario. It's also difficult to use a pure client-server communication model um, because you're expecting your devices to, to run on batteries. So these, these have, have some very high power batteries in there, but there are smaller ones uh, which have maybe just a button cell. So they, they may be sleeping, they may be um, not responding uh, and may not be able to, to communicate in, in the same sense of uh, communication protocol as, as you would expect by the uh, NetConf standard. Um, the other thing is um, we need to sort of also describe if, if you want to make our, our devices um, discoverable, we, we need to think about data modeling. And if you look at Yang, it's a fairly static um, way of describing uh, your, your, your data because Obviously, a, a router implementation or switch implementation doesn't change so much, so um, you, you can have very static, um, um, yeah, very static versioning system. And, and um, so um, <clears throat> you, you basically know this in advance. So uh, if you look at how Yang is actually being deployed, it's actually sort of you write up your, your specification and then you uh, compile it and then you push it to the client and the server, and, and then you are able to, to use NetConf. Um, that's probably not the way our devices will work, because um, pushing this, this specification onto the client device while, while it's still in the field um, may, may not be possible. So, so we need some, some other more dynamic way to generate uh, these specifications. So. What we did, if I, I said we probably don't want to do uh, NetConf directly on the device, so what we do instead? Um, what we do is we use MQTT. So this is a, a standard which has been uh, around since quite a while. Um, so it's been uh, done by by basically by IBM, um, and they started in 1999. Uh, actually, as a as a practical solution to monitor uh, physical installations, and uh, so it's been through quite some iterations, and this kind of works. And um, it's using TCP, maybe not the best solution for for such constrained devices, but it, uh, we've got some implementations running at the moment. So basically, we treat this as a way to um, push the um, the the device configuration and also to get commands back. Um, why do we use it? Because it's using a public subscribe model. Um, so we, we have a broker um, in between which decouples the, the publisher and the uh, subscriber of a topic. Topic is a, something, a message channel which um, allows you to what paste whatever data you have. So maybe some unstructured data, maybe some, some binary stuff, whatever. So how do we use this or how, how do we put this together? We want to create dynamic Yang models. So first of all, <clears throat> we need to make some bootstrapping decisions. And that's what we did here is, if you look at some of the protocols, they, they really have not very good onboarding procedures. So, so um, 
uh, even if in, in areas like co-op, um, there's, um, I feel at least there, there's something missing which uh, allows you to quickly set up things. So what we did is we did define like a command channel and um, uh, a device configuration channel. It's just something we quickly made up and um, this allows us to, first of all, push um, device configuration to the broker and then push it on to the um, uh, netconf um, netconf bridge and then get commands back from the netconf bridge which sort of allows us to um, to control our devices and we built this very complicated architecture here is um, which consists of basically two servers here one of all is our mqtt broker in the mqtt domain uh, which allows us to do very uh, low profile communication um, we get a profile which we push to the um, netconf server here we um, we uh, sort of translate this profile into a yang model then we can control uh, the netconf server and this sort of just bridges our uh, commands to the mqtt broker which again sort of translated or passes this on to the device which needs to be managed so the big question here was um, what are the basically modeling requirements um, what do we need to to put into our our data models um, first of all we need some sort of device description and identification but we also have like sensors and um, actors on on our devices which need to sort of first of all describe what kind of data they are putting out and what kind of Command values they are accepting, so this needs to be um, this needs to be modeled, and also we may have some meta information like the supported protocols, like the supported uh, middle uh, information, which needs to be uh, managed, and all this get gets to written into these these uh, files, and uh, I'll show you in a minute how how this has been done. There's a lot of folks and there's currently an, an IoT semantic interoperability workshop next door and uh, I, I felt like maybe it was more appropriate to, to their topic here what I'm describing here is but I, I think it's it's relevant for for both of them that's uh, actually there's a lot of activity in this area and what one feels it's like it's it's very heavily under development but uh, for an for an actual a user or for an actual application developer is it's very hard to to make sense of it all because there are so many competing um, initiatives and there's so little guidance on how how you would actually apply these these schemas and, and data models uh, that um, at the moment I feel like everybody's sort of rolling out their own solution um, and and uh, it may be that whatever these guys are coming up with may be too late by the time they actually finish their, their, their standardization efforts. So what we did is we did an easy choice. We just sort of rolled our own. Um, we, in order to get started, we simply uh, develop our own JSON format, which fairly closely resembles what Yang actually is doing already. So, so we are very close to what um, the final Yang model would look like. Um, here you see an example, so sort of we have a, um, we have a device uh, which has a description, has some sort of categorization. You see, that's this, at the moment it's it's not very machine readable, but maybe this this can be improved. And then we we define a sort of um, some set of um, RPCs which can be called and queried from um, our netfon netconf client, um, and then uh, sort of provides the functionality. Um, here's the corresponding um, Yang model, which has been has been generated from this information, which looks very similar. Here you see the device, uh, the device description, um, some uh, identifying data, um, and the corresponding um, RPC model, which um, allows us to control the device. So, what needs to be discussed? A lot of things, I think. <laughs> First of all, um, our experience is, has been that, that device bootstrapping is far from automatic. Um, and even if you look at um, yeah, in a sh um, if you, even if you look at, uh, at drafts from from uh, co-op where they say they have a like a 
repository function where they can where you can put your device configurations in there it's not really defined on how you get to this point where you can actually uh, register and and then query and whatever so so something is needed to make this much more painless than it is at the moment so and and everybody sort of needs to have reference point on how how you can get this stuff so maybe some sort of uh well, generic IPv6 multicast address, whatever, sort of dis defining uh, uh, something. We have enough address, so let's just let's use them for, for some good purpose here. Um, at the moment, we use, as, as I said, we use um, our own custom JSON, but there is some work going on based on what we did uh, or described in the paper, uh, where people now actually using the uh, web ontology G language, um, in order to um, sort of reproduce what what we have done and then compared compared to to uh, with their uh, results and what they found is or sort of intermediate result which we have seen is that once they use one of these languages um, they dramatically increase the size of the description and there's nothing different in their description than what I've shown you at the moment, um, but sort of just by using another uh, description language here, you, you get like six times the amount of um, configuration data uh, which needs to be pushed from the device. So, um, and what we are currently doing is we are trying to look if that this um, is can actually then sort of make, we can make some, some, um, um, well, some 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 translation from from the Yang, uh, from from the OBL to to Yang. Um, and what we haven't looked at all is like something like device management. This was kind of a rapid prototype uh, in order to show that things are working, but it's not uh, like the cure all solution where we are saying yes, that's that's how uh, we should uh, further uh, manage our devices. So, so then there's a lot of things which we haven't looked at, uh, which we would need to pick up if in order to make it a real protocol so and there's another question which comes up um, basically is that we use yang slightly out of their original definition so so i said you usually you define yang models as static models which are referenceable so they have a uri they are versionized so you can look them up later i mean they have a defined meaning in our configuration this is just ephemeral so so whenever uh, a new device onboards the network whenever something changes by some firmware update or whatever on the device we may generate a completely new yang model which is then again sort of the current model but doesn't have any relation to the the older one also our time granularity is a little bit different i mean there's versioning in yang so we could in theory, we could say, oh, just version these, these different things and, and write it into some, some data store. Um, but uh, our time granular rarity is, sorry, <laughs> is something uh, completely different from what the current model uses. So, and also, uh, Yang, as, it, as I see it, is, is at the moment very device centric. And what we would like to do in, in, in the end is that we um, but we don't want to manage a thousand devices individually or 10,000 or whatever, how many devices we, we have in the end. In the end, we wanted to have something where we aggregate um, our, our device information and make it a, a, a network which we manage. And uh, this is maybe not so much out of scope than um, the other two uh, issues, but still something which is currently not very developed in, in, in the current Yang standards. <laughs> So my question is, is this, could we use it like this or is there some strong opposition to what we did? Who knows? So currently there's a working prototype. It was kind of a moderate um, coding effort. There's some very good existing libraries which we could use. And we basically try to use this as a further step or for the development step for, for other ex 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 existing um, projects with, with our students. So this um, should be hopefully some, some good um, effort uh, which we uh, can, can work on in the future. So if you have any questions, please state them now or drop me an email or whatever. <laughs> Thank you.
Questions for Tomas? So, let's see. A little bit. so you mentioned um, the ability to run uh, the, uh, the 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 netconf bit over no the MQTT bit over TLS and um, and you also told us that it's an eight bit uh, uh, yeah. device. <laughs> so how realistic is it that we like in this realm where you want to have cheap devices that we're going to get some actual security? Okay. Do you have any thoughts on that based on the work you've done? Yeah, we, we, we actually thought about this. Um, that's um, that's a, that's a very good question. I mean, how, how do we manage security on, on such devices? Um, in, in theory, um, these devices could support DTLS, uh, but then we, should, we are running UDP, whatever. So. Um, my personal view is, and it is just purely sort of academic here, is that we could sort of construct a security boundary here at the, at the broker uh, where we say, or oh, we, whenever we talk to something outside the network, then we can use whatever encryption scheme which is uh, uh, deployable. And um, but whenever sort of these guys are being talking to the to the broker, then we we, we simply use a, a simple scheme and we just just make to be sure that um, we, they can't be reached from the outside. So we, we need, would need some, some some very serious filtering here, some very serious uh, security policies in place uh, to, to make this happen. But uh, that, that's, a, that's a very good question uh, because I think it's it's also, even if we could deploy TLS at the moment, um, my feeling is that like the life cycles of these uh, technologies are completely different. I mean, if you're talking about uh, internet-related stuff, uh, nobody would think that sort of uh, the current TLS standards will survive another five years. There will be another one and another one and another one and sort of. Uh, but here we, we may have may have installations like your fridge or whatever your air conditioning system, which has a life cycle which is multi times than, than, than an ordinary computer. So so it, I think in the end, it's it's kind of futile to try to push security on these little devices here. Um, and I think my, my personal view is much, much better invested to, to, to have a, a clear security boundary um, um, in the network and, and then sort of use the broker here as a kind of a um, offloading security uh, functions um, instead of pushing them how to the devices. Thanks. Was, was this so funny? <laughs> just, just, as a, just as a follow up, isn't, isn't the last hop wireless? It is, yeah. How, 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 how do you build a security boundary? Do you protect uh, limit or radio waves or? Well you, you, well, you can have link layer encryption. I mean, that's, 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 that's what you usually use in this kind of network. So, so you have a link layer protection, but I mean, this, this obviously just goes to the next router or whatever so but, but yeah but, but i actually came up for a different question since mm -hmm. you had this um your uh, issues list there yeah. with the what how should this model be looking like how would us have have you had any thoughts on how um one would one could preserve the properties that the usual yang models identifiable forever with the uri could you come up with a generation and archiving scheme or something that those properties could be preserved so that you have a fair a, a fair chance to talk to the people without uh, being shut down immediately? I'm just wondering whether there's, whether there's architectural considerations or design considerations that you could put forward here. Well, the, the thing is, uh, for me, I, it doesn't make much sense to, 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 to make these, these Yang models referable. I mean, I, I don't think there's a hard... Uh, Architectural constraint here. I mean, we, we we could whenever sort of a new kind of model is generated, whenever new kind of uh, data comes in, and I, I expect these kind of networks to be very um, flexible and very very uh, rapidly changing. So what what would happen here is that you may generate new Yang models in in a very short time frame. Um, there is no particular reason you couldn't store these devices, the, uh, these, these configurations. The, the, the only reason I was thinking about is why would you? 
um, because it's... Well, if, 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 if the building burns down and you want to figure sure. out what was the reason, it might be useful to understand yeah. in retrospect what has been an operation at which point in time and which okay. section of that building. You, that's, that's, that's fine. Yeah, thank, thanks for, for this comment. I'm, you, you're completely right. I mean, in, if, if we would have these very strong uh, um, requirements, we possibly can build them in here. I was just thinking there's... Um, it, it, in order to make this... Um, in order to align this with the current Yang um, specifications, they would need it to um, to at least sort of augment their time base because at the moment I think the the current Yang uh, granularity for for versions uh, in in the Yang, current Yang standard is a day, so so you can't be more specific than this, and sort of if you would use the the, the current existing um, um, mechanisms, then um, we would need to extend them somehow, yeah. Okay, Great. okay. thank you, Thomas. Okay. Okay, Martin? So our next paper is No Domain Left Behind is Let's Encrypt, Democratizing Encryption. Uh, authors are Martin Erickson from Delft University Technology, Masej Korzynski from Delft University of Technology, sorry Masej, uh, Giovanni Mora, SIDN Labs, Samana Tajalitz de Kub from Delft University Technology, and Jan Vandenberg from Delft University Technology. Uh, Martin works at NCSC Netherlands as an advisor on the security of internet network infrastructure, standards and protocols. He has an interest in cryptography and its lack of deployment. NCSC NL is part of the central Dutch government. Its mission is to contribute to the enhancement of the resilience of Dutch society in the digital domain and thus to create a secure, open and stable information society. NCSC Netherlands functions as an information hub and Center of Knowledge for Information Security and also hosts the Computer Emergency Response Team for the Dutch Central Government. Martin holds a Master of Science from the University of Twente in Telematics and a Master of Science from Leiden University in Cybersecurity Governance. This is his first time at the IETF. He's here to understand how he and his employer can contribute in this realm, follow developments, and make new acquaintances with similar interests. And I hope you're, are you sharing your passwords with everyone? Is that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a that's a great thing to do on your first visit to the ITF. You'll make a lot of friends. People will help you with your email. And be sure to leave your instant messaging up so that we can all share and uh, feedback that goes on. That's right. You'll get a mentor this way very quickly. <laughs> Uh, yeah. If you're having yeah. trouble, we can put it on my laptop. No, it looks like there. you got it. Getting there. Okay. People want to hear what you have to say. So thanks for the first laugh. Um, I'm. I think I'm. <laughs> I'm behind uh, between you and your your next coffee break. So I, uh, in order to, to keep everyone awake, I have three questions, and we'll do some exercise lifting hands. So this talk is about uh, Let's Encrypt. Um, who's heard of Let's Encrypt? Lots of exercise. Cool. Uh, who has personally used Let's Encrypt? Okay, about half maybe. Are there people in the room who have used Let's Encrypt on a large scale? Like on. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so this, this talk is about um, uh, the deployment or the, the use of Let's Encrypt in its first year. Um, I did this as a thesis work uh, last year, so um, it's also data from last year. People who have attended the Chicago uh, MapRG uh, talk of Giovanni have perhaps uh, seen some of this, 
And for those people, I expect uh, a good criticism because you've had some time to think about this. So, uh, so, so please, please uh, um, uh, do save those for, for uh, later. Um, one thing we got asked when we talked about this is whether we are affiliated with Let's Encrypt and we're not. Um, so uh, um, we're independent and uh, um, it's, it, this research was kind of born out of uh, an interest to find out whether their statistics uh, yeah, could be improved or, or what, the, what another uh, crew of people would think um, measuring their progress. So uh, the, the uh, quick motivation was basically uh, this guy and, and the revelations uh, he, uh, he brought uh, into the, the community. Um, so I think uh, since uh, the, uh, the, the news uh, broke, we've seen uh, uh, wider spread encryption on the, on the internet. And um, I'll, I won't go into that in too much detail, but you can also plot it on, on, on browser telemetry. So if you look in the same period of, uh, at the adoption of HTTPS on the web um, for, for basically random people, um, we've crossed the 50% uh, mark somewhere. Um, and that, that's, that's really cool because that, that's been a long time coming and it's been, I guess, the hard work of many people. On the other hand, it also means that there's a lot of people on the internet who do not have HTTPS. So um, one of the questions I, I ask myself is like, wh why is this why is this the case? And it turned out that lots of people have been doing work in this area and, and one of the principal reasons that were identified as, as, uh, as tr uh, well troubling in this area is the use of uh, certificates. Um, so barriers to, to ubiquitous encryption on the web um, are uh, the cost of purchase deployment and, and, and renewal of certificates. Um, and it's also, it's not just that, it's also if you want to do this at scale, and at scale is if you do it for people who are not in the business of running IT or running networks or doing security, like maybe the bakery on, on the corner of your street, uh, you need to do it for a lot of people. And then you run into the, the complexity issues. So there's basically two, two, two barriers here. And um, the people at Let's Encrypt, they aim to make uh, this ubiquitous. So they, they two, two main, I think, contributions they, they uh, make is um, bring the cost down to, to free. Uh, they don't, do not charge for, for certificates and uh, they uh, employ automation. I, I think there's even, a, there's, there's been an ACME working group at the ITF for, for a while now. And um, uh, that, that spar yeah, there's two parts to this. There's a protocol to actually request a certificate and, and, and obtain one. And there is uh, software implementing this protocol, which can help you to, for example, configure your web server or deploy the certificates at scale. So that's all uh, the work of other people. Um, what I was interested in is to find out whether the first year of Let's Encrypt helped them reach those people that would need this most. So if, if you think about this, the big websites already had encryption in some cases. And uh, uh, they were slowly moving over, but at least they would have the money and maybe also the brain power to, to make this work. So the other well, uh, part of the web is, is, is end users. And, and uh, my question would be like, has Let's Encrypt been successful in its first year to democratize the use of encryption on the web? Um, how did we do this? Well, this was uh, measurement work and it was um, basically uh, analyzing uh, the first year of issuance. Uh, we did not look at deployment, which is a, uh, uh, which is, uh, definitely something which is uh, uh, much more interesting, but it's also much harder if you want to look back. So what we did was look at issuance in the first year, and then we show adoption or requests for which certificates were issued from various perspectives and, and analyze the uh, coverage within the market. We did the first year, September 2015 was uh, when they went uh, uh, live or they, they issued the first certificates. I think they went live in October uh, until one year later. And um, all results I'll show you are reduced to uh, TLD, 2LD or 3LD form. So for TLDs that have, uh, well, end in, for example, .nl, we look at domain.nl. For the .co.uk type of TLDs, we look at domain.co.uk. Um, what data sets are used? For the certificates, we use certificate transparency. Who's familiar with certificate transparency? 
in the shower. So certificates transparency is basically an append-only log of uh, all certificates seen um, as submitted by various parties. And the nice thing about uh, guys at Let's Encrypt is guys and girls is that they um, decided to um, uh, submit all the issued certificates they ever coined. So that means that we actually have data to we have the data um, we have access to all the issued certificates um, worldwide. And um, um, but if you want to to understand like who's using this, you need to map to organizations, uh, and we do that in two steps. Um, at Delft, there was access to uh, Farsight DNS DB, which is a passive DNS data set. Um, and um, in previous work, they used uh, Maxify GeoIP and, and, and Whois data to actually uh, create, to, to bundle IP addresses into organizations. And organizations there's hosters. So what can you do? And, and now I'll, I'll just walk you through the, the different results in different stages. So these were the numbers which were like publicly known. Um, and um, it's just the growth of the service. So you, you first see uh, the growth in, in unique uh, FQDNs, which uh, hit 10 million around sep uh, September uh, 16. If you um, look at the domain, so you, you uh, get rid of all the people issuing certificates for uh, 100 machines under their own domain, um, it, it's, it's much lower. It's around 4 million. Well, that, that's, that's a nice number in a year, but what does it really tell you? Um, you, you can get like relative numbers if you compare it um, with all known domains worldwide uh, as found in the specific DNS data set. And what you then get is the uh, number of 2% of all domains worldwide uh, as contained in this data set um, have uh, an, at least one certificate issued by Let's Encrypt. And then you you can really see why this is a big thing because two percent in a year is is pretty 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 nice. Um, so that's just the raw numbers. Now, who is using Let's Encrypt? So if you look at at popular website uh, websites, you can basically see that it it stabilizes uh, in in the summer of 2016, and every time you increase your top list with a factor of 10, they also contribute a factor of 10 more to the overall percentage of, of, uh, of uh, certificates or d domains, sorry. So uh, your, your Alexa top 1000 has a contribution of like 0.01% uh, uh, and uh, it, it, it goes up in ten, tens and tens and tens. And what's interesting about this is that if you look at uh, the top Alexa 1 million, they only have about 2% coverage, which means that the other 98% are not for popular websites, or at least not for popular websites if you look at it from the perspective of Alexa. What's, that's kind of, well, you could expect that. What's more interesting actually is you if you turn it around. So if you look at um, within each ranking, um, what is the percentage that is using that's encrypt you get to the point where you see that the most popular domains on the planet, according to Alexa, um, actually have the higher percentage use. So 18% of the Alexa 1000 domains employ people who know about Let's Encrypt and they've issued a certificate within their domain uh, within a year. So um, I, I guess that's a, a good bit of outreach and that kind of um, slows down when you go to the, um, the bigger sets. So um, what we can conclude from, from, from statistics like this, this is that issuance is not restricted to the lower end of the market. Also, the, the bigger websites are, are basically doing this. We verified that it's not just, this is not the, um, the, the, like the, the, the big, um, the, the slash on the website, like the front page. Um, it's usually not. So we, we got uh, hits for was the Washington uh, uh, Street, Wall Street Journal, for the uh, Le Monde, and for some other newspapers. And every time you had a hit like that, it's not for the front page. It's for, for example, internal system, a testing system, or something uh, um, uh, auxiliary, auxiliary, which points to the fact that it's probably engineers who like this stuff and, and just try it, which is nice. So um, enough with the popular domains. What 
who is not who's actually contributing to this growth and I'll, I'll take a little bit explaining this graph because it's not immediately intuitive um, unfortunately um, so what this graph shows you is on the the bottom axis is all organizations we identified so an organization is an entity having hosting or um, with with IP addresses associated um, hosting one or more domains we we know about um, on the uh, on the y-axis, there's all the Let's Encrypt domains. So in November 2015, 14k domains were covered with at least one certificate. And on the top, we have all known domains uh, using DNSDB. So in November 2015, the DNSDB had uh, uh, 127 unique domains. Now, if you sort organizations from small to large, what you get in this graph is the relative contribution of a, an organization to the overall deploy the overall issuance of let's encrypt so you can see here that the the, the bottom 25% of small organization is almost 25% of the, uh, the 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 let's encrypt issuance and it it's it's more or less nice so there's there's no large discontinuities although for some parts of the IP space, we do not know what organization it is. So that's, all, I guess, always what you get. Um, and it becomes interesting when you go to September 2016 or other months. And here you can see these discontinuities uh, start showing up, um, which means is that there is a single organization responsible for large parts of the issued certificates um, um, in there you know, um, uh, as a single entity. It turns out this is uh, this is three uh, web hosters, and uh, when we started looking at this uh, in the beginning, you could nicely align these uh, statistics with published press statements. Uh, so every time you find the discontinuity, you start looking or watching press statements, and yes, sure, within a couple of weeks there would be a press statement like, "Hey, we uh, we will announce this for or we will uh, start giving all our customers uh, HTTPS for free, and we do this using Let's Encrypt." And um, by September 2016, um, three hosting providers are responsible for 47% of all certified domains. And uh, well, this, this the, the lower part more or less stays the same. These hosting providers at that point were um, WordPress.com, OVH, the French hosting provider, and, and Shopify, a, a vendor of um, uh, online shopping. And since there have been a, a couple of large joiners, but that was outside our measurement period. So what is the, um, the business of these organizations? Like what are they doing? Um, and no real surprises here. So if you try to classify organizations in different uh, areas, you can see that the, 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 over the, the large part is either unknown, which is the white sp uh, stuff on the bottom, or uh, web hosting. And all the, the unknown bits are small organizations, because if, it, if we would find an organization with an unknown um, uh, or like business, uh, we would do it by hand. So all these unknowns are the very small ones, which uh, would add up to a lot of manual work. But still, you can see that it's about 70% of, uh, of hosting, no surprises. However, if you zoom in on hosting and you try to distinguish shared versus non-shared hosting, uh, something interesting happens, which is actually new for, for this industry, I think, is that um, if you define shared hosting as at least 10 domains per IP address, this is IPv4, unfortunately, um, just to, to mention it quickly, uh, <laughs> um, you can see that more than 90% of all uh, hosting which has Let's Encrypt domains, uh, certified domains associated with, is in the shared hosting business. And that's the, the, the cheap hosting, which also means that this is certificates, most likely for people who would not have had these certificates if, uh, if the provider would not have provided them. So this is where we, we kind of get uh, to my, my research question is, does Let's Encrypt contribute to getting certificates where they weren't previously? Uh, well, yes, they are, because this is the market where uh, it would previously not scale to, to, to supply um, uh, well, certificates and therefore encryption to customers. Um, I'll get to an open question here, also for the audience later, because there's a related question which I was not able to answer, but I've heard rumors which might allow us to answer it. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll talk to that in a little bit. 
We did also some other um, statistics. So if you look at renewal, uh, Let's Encrypt certificates are only valid for 30 days. So once you get a certificate, um, you need to renew it. And the automation allows you to automate that, which uh, makes up for the short lifetime. But it also allows us to really uh, uh, quantify whether or not people see this as a, a one trick like pony, like to tr try to just try it once, it's nice, and then we turn it off again. Because what this uh, graph quantifies, it's um, um, uh, it, it, it basically uh, shows you the amount of uh, people as a fraction uh, that continue uh, renewing their uh, domains or certificates for domains. So the first, uh, and I see I made a mistake, so uh, certificates are uh, valid for 90 days, not 30. But after, so uh, 90 days, everyone's valid, no one, uh, no one dies in the in the in the in the in the graph, and then you can see these renewals. Um, but the fact that after almost uh, two cycles, um, the the graph flattens shows you that this automation is working, uh, because um, at that point, uh, well, you wouldn't expect uh, uh, something like uh, 0.7 of all these millions of domains uh, be renewed by hand. So clearly, something is 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 working. Um, funnily enough, when I asked the Let's Encrypt guys about this, they said, oh, this is terrible because we're, we're still missing uh, like this, this 0.3 uh, uh, fraction. I can also get that, but I, I think it's pretty nice. The green line shows you um, what the, 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 the statistic would have been if you would allow one week of like troubleshooting. So suppose you, get, you don't get automation right the first try, but you, um, you, you find out because you go to your website and it doesn't work you fix it, then you can see that the first time that that really makes a little bit of a difference and afterwards the, the, the lines uh, re remain similarly flat. So in a sense this shows you that people get the automation right either the first time or after the next time and, and it, it doesn't really, uh, after the first uh, try, it, it seems to work. Um, let's see. Um, some uh, a bit of a summary. Uh, so certificate issuance in the first year of Let's Encrypt, uh, widely used, um, especially in the low cost market of shared hosting. And specifically this market would be unlikely to use certificates and therefore encryption um, without those uh, uh, certificates. And uh, why is that? Well, it's because it allows hosters to um, issue and deploy uh, certificates in bulk. Remain active. So uh, this is the um, uh, um, the full measurement period. Uh, they we, we saw that that 0.7 uh, of all certified domains uh, kept on renewing, which implies that they keep running the software. Well, they can do it by hand, but it's not very uh, uh, likely. Um, and um, uh, that's that's after the first issuance because that that's what you get for free. Um, so that's the summary. We also have quite some future work in the sense that this is only the start and I hope others will uh, uh, also independently uh, measure the, the progress made and also maybe the, 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 the things which are not going as well. Um, there's, there's a simple thing to extend the measurement period. Um, it's also interesting to, to me measure actual use versus issuance. Um, for example, such as uh, uh, active scanning although you, especially for Let's Encrypt, you, you run into the trouble that you need SNI uh, because all these shared domains, well, reuse IP addresses. Um, and we've seen uh, uh, a lot of abuse, uh, basically because it, it's now so much simpler to request certificates. Um, and it would be interesting to, to understand the, the patterns there. Um, um, that's it. I have a question for the audience before I, I open up for questions. <laughs> and that's, um, I've heard that, um, so I talked to the Let's Encrypt people and they show a statistic that 98% uh, of the uh, uh, domains they certify or the, uh, the, the certificates they, they, uh, they issue are for domains or FUDNs that are not previously, uh, did not previously get certified. And that would directly answer my research question. But that answer is based on the assumption that Google actually uh, puts, uh, crawls the web, 
and put certificates uh, in CT. And I've never seen uh, evidence for that claim. So, so there is a lot of certificates in CT. It's, it's huge and it, it will get huge, uh, bigger and bigger. But uh, you can only say something about the past if you know that the sampling is OK. And that would imply that some party needs to actually put in certificates from all CAs, not just the ones that participate. Does anyone have more information about this? I, I think there, there might be some people working for the sponsors of Let's Encrypt in the room. I see mostly blank faces. No? Yeah, too bad. Well, I keep trying. Um, in that case, thank you very much for your attention. Um, and um, um, I'm, uh, I'm open for questions. Any questions for Martin? Hey. <laughs> Rants? Um, hello, Thomas. Um, I just wonder, um, do you see uh, that, that uh, shared hosting providers are actually picking up on this? Because when I last looked at Germany, there was nobody um, uh, using it or, or, or sort of offering it to their customers. And I, I thought it might be. I mean, it might be actually an incentive for them to, to offer this to their customers, especially now that sort of browsers are, are much more um, sort of, yeah, making it much more more visible that, that you're not, not using a, a secure website and such. Yeah, I, I'm, I haven't looked at Germany specifically, but I have looked or I've followed the news also after the measurement periods for the Netherlands. And you see uh, that uh, uh, web hosters are uh, slowly adopting this uh, because it, it also there, I don't think there's that much demand, but it, 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 it's nice to, to uh, contrast yourself against your competitors um, in, in this way. Um, similarly, I think um, in the larger um, uh, software packages for web hosters, so the, the C panels, etc., uh, it seems that this is being integrated now. So um, even for those web, maybe smaller web hosters that are not directly interested in, in offering the feature, if it would cost them engineering time, I think over time the, the 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 chance increases that they just get it with their software. So uh, um, yeah, I think I, I, I wouldn't know specific of Germany, yeah. but in Netherlands I see it. Uh, uh, there is some uptake. Yeah. So one needs to ask them. Oh, <laughs> what's your conclusion? I mean, how how can we make this um, sort of make this more deployed in in order to well. I, I don't ex expect the, the demand coming from the customer, but because as you said at the first, I mean, it's sort of you're targeting the little bakery on the, on the corner of the street, which sort of doesn't really need to know or doesn't have the knowledge that they, that they might be, can you use something like this? And then so therefore, I don't think that there's a, a pull demand, uh, demand uh, market here. I think it's much more reasonable to assume that, that there is some responsibility at the, the hosting side saying, oh, I'm just offering it this, even if I have been asked especially for this. I have no hard data to support, support this, uh, but my, my looking into, for example, these big newspapers uh, using Let's Encrypt within their domain um, kind of gave me the impression that there is actually an interest in, in what maybe the kind of engineering community to just try this. And then if it works, well, perhaps it gets deployed wider. I, I think that's one part of the uh, thing. I, I think the, uh, the, the, the clues uh, uh, being integrated in browsers will have a larger effect. But that's just wild conjecture on my part, and I don't have the data to support it. So um, take, take it with a grain of salt. Do you know if it's the price or the convenience that is a driver? Sorry? Do you know if the, if the price level or the convenience that is the main driver? for this democratization? Um, well, based on the parties that have deployed, I would assume uh, the convenience, like the automation, because I don't have any other reason why these, these, these big hosters suddenly start to do it now. Because there, there used to be free certificates before, maybe from the CAs that um, are now either um, uh, bankrupt or uh, not so trusted anymore. But I mean, the free part was not new on its own. It was just, well, very annoying to make a scale. So so I would say an automation. But. I, I can add just a tiny bit of information that uh, Akamai um, uh, accepts only Let's Encrypt certs for uh, domain validation. So that may encourage some set of users. Um, yeah, no, I'm a co-author. I just want to 
to also answer back to the previous question. I think this is a question of incentives. Um, so what Let's Encrypt set out to do is to remove the technical barriers to adoption of that. So if that would catch up, I think it's a thing of the market. It's not. I, I don't think it's in the scope of Let's Encrypt. I cannot speak for them. But if people want to use this right there, and I think if like a local governments or whatever, the market demands that you actually have free encryption, it's going to happen. But again, it's a classic problem incentives. It's not technical actually anymore. I thought the question that uh, Randy kind of raised earlier was an interesting one, which is, you know, how, well, if, if people, are people just doing this, trying it out, and then discarding it, or are they actually continuing to use it? Is this, is this going to be, is there some persistent benefit, or is it, is there going to be some attrition? So, so you this mean it has been long enough to know for sure? Yeah. And this is just issuance. So we, we did um, we did a limited sample of, of uh, like scans of um, uh, whether people are actually using it. And in our limited sample of 25K uh, domains, we saw that 63% actually configured it and were using it, which is only a lower bound because you could also use it on protocols we didn't scan. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty early. But yeah, I think it'd be interesting if you were able to do some longitudinal measurements where you saw uh, domains that had been using it stopped using it, as opposed to just looking at aggregate numbers, really looking at for, you know, particular domains if they had, mm. because, you know, there's all sorts of things that can affect whether there's a, a domain yep. is, still has traffic or not. And we hope that uh, follow-up work could be, for example, to see if um, people switch to other CAs after using Let's Encrypt, because I would be very interested to understand the reasons for it, for that. Um, and if you find them, you may ask them. Yeah. yeah, apparently it shows up differently on your browser bar. Yeah, yeah, of course. Different but kinds of that, That's a different market. I mean, it's yeah. This is only DV. So for for the green uh, lock icon and so that they're not a competitor at all. Yeah. Right. Now I just want to add. I also work for a, a, a TLD operator, so it's about the domain life cycle. There's also another thing of the domain life. Domains expire. They they registrants they move the domains for other registrars. They might not have let's encrypt. So it's, it's not such an easy. I mean, it's possible to answer, but it's a little tricky question as well. So yeah, that's a good that. point. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks very much, Martin. Thanks. Okay, so now it's time for more caffeine and water, and then we reconvene at four for a panel.